I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escal. As we are recording this program on Thursday, uh, President Biden has just released his climate plan. It, it is, of course, Earth Day today, Thursday. And joining us now to discuss that climate plan is Marcella Mulholland. She's been on the program before. Marcella is the political director at Data for Progress, and she represents that organization's work on the Green, Green New Deal and on uh, progressive climate policy. Uh, and before that, she had a pretty extensive background in climate-related organizing as well. So first of all, Marcella, welcome back to the program. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be back. Well, we're delighted to have you. And let's just jump right into it. Uh, first of all, uh, if you could give us a brief summary of the Biden plan. I know a lot of listeners will have read about it, but just, you know, a few words about what it, what it aims to do. Yeah, so Biden proposed um, something he's calling the American Jobs Plan. It's kind of following the theme of the American Rescue Plan, and then he's expected to announce an American Families Plan soon. Um, and the American Jobs Plan is essentially a jobs and infrastructure package that addresses a whole wide array of issues from clean water infrastructure, transportation, clean energy, um, child care facilities. And it's really exciting for folks in the climate movement because there are significant investments made toward transitioning and decarbonizing our society. Um, it calls for the creation of a civilian climate core. Um, it calls for significant funding to be allocated toward climate innovation. And these are all really big steps toward getting the United States to be a global leader on addressing the climate crisis. So it sounds, Marcella, like you give this uh, plan a pretty good grade. Is that fair to say? Um, I think it's a, certainly a good first step. Um, I think a lot of folks in the climate movement, myself included, um, have some concerns about the scale of the investments. Um, there's something called the Thrive Agenda that's kind of the progressive flank um, to the American Jobs Plan. And that agenda calls for $10 trillion of investment over a decade, so $1 trillion a year. Um, and that's much more closely aligned with what I think the United States needs to be investing in um, addressing this challenge. Um, I will say there are a lot of strong components of the American Jobs Plan. And I think I think as a progressive, I feel excited about the possibility of negotiating and pushing for this package to be as progressive and ambitious as possible. So it's a, a pretty good starting point, um, but I think there's room to grow um, and to make it better. So, and I know at one point, I think uh, Bernie Sanders actually floated the figure $16 trillion. So uh, $10 trillion seems to be the benchmark. How much money does this plan uh, allocate for climate reduction, for climate change reduction? Um, so the package is around $2 trillion, and it's um, difficult to measure exactly how much goes to climate just because some of it is tax credits that would then have like a broader impact once in the market. Market, but there are um, really significant investments made toward environmental justice initiatives. Um, like I said earlier, it calls for the creation of a civilian climate core, which, which is really exciting because it would both address kind of the economic crisis and unemployment crisis that young people are facing while also putting them to work, um, helping to stop climate change, doing different projects that help to capture carbon, help to um, bring back nature-based solutions to reducing pollution and things like that, which are really um, um, I think an intersectional approach to the climate crisis, which represents kind of the policies that we need to be advancing because the moment we live in, it's not just climate change that we're dealing with, obviously with the pandemic and the economic fallout from coronavirus. We need policies that really speak to um, people's lives and people don't lead single issue lives. Exactly. And ironically, as you know, the pandemic has actually uh, cut our, uh, our greenhouse gas emissions as people travel less, but that's a temporary change. And speaking of that, Marcella Mulholland of Data for Progress, uh, the plan uh, states that its objective is to cut uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the United States uh, more or less in half by 2030, which is less than 10 years away. Uh, does it seem to you and to others that you talk to that it, it's likely to be able to do that? 
I mean, I think the objective is good. Um, TBD exactly what um, kind of plans the administration puts forward to actually make those goals become a reality. I think so far it's been a little bit um, unclear exactly how they'll go about making this come to life. Um, I think they have, you know, several options at their disposal. Obviously, through the executive branch, there's quite a great deal that Biden can do from federal procurement policy, where he kind of leverages the federal government's enormous purchasing power to um, buy clean energy products and incentivize kind of that um, to incentivize growth of that sector in, in the private sector. Um, also through the different agencies, he appointed um, Secretary Deb Holland to lead Department of Interior, and she's really a seasoned climate justice advocate. And it's really exciting to see her in such a leadership position. Um, and Biden has also, you know, taken on really progressive climate people into his staff. Um, Maggie Thomas is chief of staff at the um, Office of Domestic Climate Policy. She used to work for Jay Inslee's campaign and Senator Warren's campaign and is really, um, you know, a, a climate policy wonk that's very progressive. So there's the stuff happening on the executive branch that's really promising. And then obviously when you have to deal with Congress, it gets a little more complicated given our, um, you know, delightful political system. Um, so I think it's TBD if, if Democrats try to push through something via reconciliation, which I think is probably the best if we're unable to get rid of the filibuster, um, because, you know, compromising with Republicans will almost uh, necessarily decrease the scale and size of the package. Um, so I think the objective that the administration is laying out is good. And, and now it's really um, on us as a movement and on legislators to push it over the finish line in the best way that we can. Well, and speaking of pushing it over the finish line, and we can talk in a second about where activism fits into all that, but it seems to me, even if it's done through reconciliation, you have uh, Kristen Sinema, Senator Sinema from Arizona, you have Joe Manchin, Senator Manchin from West Virginia. Um, do you have any sense of whether Biden is going to be able to, you know, we may agree that it's not at the scale uh, uh, that, the, that the left flank uh, like us would like to see, but it's still a pretty big proposal. And do we have any sense whether the so-called moderate Democrats, the conservative Democrats are going to get in the way or cooperate on this one? It's the $2 trillion question, isn't it, Richard, trying to figure out where Senator Manchin stands on all of this. And it seems like he, um, you know, changes his mind or says something different every week or so. Um, I think Senator Manchin really wants to get an infrastructure package over the finish line. And um, he is, you know, aware of and I think very clear that climate change is something that the federal government needs to allocate resources and significant um, investments toward addressing. Um, he might have a different idea of how to go about that than, you know, myself and other progressives. Um, but I do think like, you know, I think Manchin has a stake in this as well, representing West Virginia, a state that has um, so many coal jobs and like really would benefit from an infrastructure package that prioritizes frontline communities and, and brings about a just transition away from fossil fuels. Um, so I think Manchin is, is kind of at the negotiating table with those priorities in mind, which are priorities that I share, you know, frontline communities include right. communities that are affected by pollution and in frontline communities, I think that's kind of how it's traditionally interpreted and, and rightfully so those communities should be prioritized. But a frontline community is also a coal mining community that has um, their water polluted, their air polluted by that industry and also significantly economically impacted by what we do on climate. Um, so I'm, I think progressives are excited about and open to negotiating on what the just transition looks like. And again, those are priorities we share with Senator Manchin. Um, Senator Sinema from Arizona is a little harder to read from my perspective. Um, I'm not quite sure like what exactly are her uh, uh, you know, driving motivations. I think it might just be, you know, thinking about her career and electoral prospects. Um, but we did polling in Arizona that um, showed that Arizona voters prioritize um, passing big and bold coronavirus relief and um, in investing in climate solutions um, at a really significant scale. So I think if Kristen Cinema is reading the room correctly, you know, the moment is now to act big and to 
to do a lot to bring back um, jobs and to revitalize our economy and to address climate change. Um, and we'll continue to do polling there and to make the case for that. And of course, and again, we're talking with Mar Marcella Mulholland of Data for Progress. And of course, there are frontline communities in Arizona as well. Um, Marcella, one of the things that's interesting to watch for me in all of this is the way the business community is kind of breaking out in this, in that obviously, as always with a legislation that's on the progressive side, uh, there's opposition from the business community. But, yeah, I was reading today that the, some of the businesses who are going to like loudly support this measure, to use the Wall Street Journal's language, uh, Apple, Johnson & Johnson, even Walmart. So you're sort of seeing this weird, uh, you know, and I'm just sort of an anti-corporate type, but we're sort, of, <laughs> we're sort of seeing this weird situation where maybe we can actually get those people while we're trying to unionize them and do all of that uh, to say the right thing or exert pressure in the right direction. Uh, is that true or false, you think? Progressive beacon, Walmart. <laughs> Right, exactly. It's nuts. I mean, I know. It. Um, but, but, you know. No, I, I hear you. I think. Yeah, I don't know what to think about it, but I think maybe if we're thinking strategically, we want to leverage that. I mean, also with the Georgia voting restrictions bill that they just passed, corporate America right. um, kind of came out strongly against that. I think, I mean, I agree with you. I'm, I'm not, you know, don't love corporations, but to the extent that like, you know, they're really powerful actors in our society and our politics and to get them aligned with um, the bills that we want to pass. I mean, I think uh, politics is a, a game of addition, not subtraction. And like the tent uh, to get something like this across the finish line has to be big. And like, um, you know, if corporate America wants to come out in support of uh, an American jobs plan that helps tackle climate change, that's fine. I, I worry about, you know, potentially what is happening behind the scenes of like right. what they're lobbying for to be included or excluded and, and what interests those serve. Um, so obviously keeping an eye on that. And um, yeah, I was, I think there are, it's tough also, especially with oil and gas companies, like a lot of them now are paying lip service to wanting to address climate change and are doing quite a bit of greenwashing. I, I get these ads on YouTube right. of like BP sure. It's like the most beautiful nature advertisement. And then you see BP in the corner um, right. talking about wind turbines, et cetera. So I think. I see those too. And speaking, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but. No, go ahead. Speaking of weatherizing and winterizing, uh, you know, that's according to what I read, weatherizing is not that cost effective. Uh, and if you're going to spend a limited amount of money, a finite amount of money on climate change, it's not the best you know, so-called bank for your buck, but there are a lot of businesses who like it and a lot of, you know, organizations who like it for other reasons. So that strikes me as an example, correct me if I'm wrong, but that strikes me as an example of something that got in this bill because you got to make deals to make something happen uh, or that's the logic. What do you think? I mean, I think weatherization is obviously really important and, and energy efficiency initiatives and, and requirements that can be passed are really, you know, critical for this. I think it's interesting also to your point about the corporations, like where were they when the Trump administration was like doing a bunch of horrible shit, Good rolling point. back yeah. environmental regulations and, um, you know, just over overtly denying the climate crisis. I think, you know, they're just reading the room in terms of of who has power now and where the country is moving toward. And I think, right. you know, they don't want to be left out of the process. So, um, you know, I don't necessarily trust that. I think they are just responding to the political incentives that are available to them. I think so too. And I still want to nationalize the oil companies. Anyway, <laughs> Me so, too, Richard. Oh, good. Okay. So before I let you go, Marcella, just th that last question we promised to, to touch upon, which is uh, what do you think is going to be the role of activism and all this? Yeah, I think it's a good question. And one I reflect on quite a bit. Um, I mean, as someone who joined the climate movement, like 2017, 2018, to now reflect on, you know, how far we've come. And in many ways, you know, this was the ideal plan. It was, you know, have a, a blue wave in 2018, where we elect progressives. And, you know, that's when AOC was elected, which made waves. 
across the party in the country. And then in 2020 to elect, um, you know, a president who wasn't progressive's top choice, but certainly is more responsive to progressive demands and frankly has been pretty um, good on climate thus far was a win. And then to also have a trifecta, I feel like um, thinking about activism's role, it's important to like look at how far, how these political dynamics that we find ourselves in are very much a result of years of organizing and strategizing. Um, you know, I was part of Sunrise Movement when, you know, Republicans had a trifecta <laughs> and it was TBD, like it was a very bleak time for climate activists and, and across, you know, the country and progressive the progressive movement more broadly. Um, so, you know, so activists got us here. I think now that we're have governing power, the role changes and it's right. an interesting dynamic, you know, cause it's easier to, to throw stones when you're not in power. And then when you are in power, it's like you suddenly have to work with the Democrats that you weren't a huge fan of a year ago and, and probably still aren't, but oh, now yeah. ah. you, you have more in common than and shared goals of wanting to pass something. Um, so I think the role of, of progressive activists now is kind of towing the line and, and as like just providing the moral clarity and urgency on the issue. And um, it's also now time for kind of the wonks and the, the technocrats and the people behind the scenes to really um, bring their policy expertise to this moment where um, activists created the space for the politics to right. change. And now we need kind of these wonks to, to go in and, and make it happen. And to the extent that progressives can support that and then also continue to provide um, moral clarity and just a sense of urgency that this is what needs to happen and we really don't have that much time to make it happen is, is where I see activism playing a role. Yeah, and you know, we're, we're, we're kind of out of time, but I got to ask no, you this feel free. last thing too, which is, um, and I think about this all the time, is that when we're out of power, as activists, we can lay out our vision of what the world should be and needs to be and must be, which is a very different world from the world we live in today, right? And yet, here we are now in this kind of different space. And what I think about a lot, and I'd love to end with your thoughts on this, is how do we, for, this is a perfect example, fight for a, a $2 trillion bill or a trillion dollar bill when we need 10 or 16, when we need to really restructure the way we relate to the environment, profit from it, growth, all those things. So how do we, I, I'm struggling with this a lot, fight for these incremental improvements like this bill while not losing the inspiration, the vision, and the message to other people that we're going to have to do a lot more than this and quickly. So uh, you, do you know what I'm Oh, do I at? know what you're saying? I mean, it's yeah. tough to reconcile. Um, it really is. And I mean, it speaks to, I think, how broken our democratic and legislative processes are because they are so unresponsive to public opinion changing and what the public like, wants and prioritizes. I mean, I think you know, I work all day like on climate politics and policy and, and have, you know, been wanting for years and, and allocating a lot of time and energy on my part to like helping make this happen. And also to think like of the bill that passes a Senate with Joe Manchin as the 50th vote is not a bill that like I would ever, you know, it's not a bill that would have inspired me if you told me about it, you know, three years ago. And at the same time, the bill that passes and that can get Manchin's vote is the one that will actually, you know, be able to to create change in the world because it's better than than no bill passing. Um, and that's tough to reconcile. I mean, I think um, I share the, the tension and, and don't know what to do with it. I think right now I'm very focused on, you know, this is really a, a, an opportunity and a moment. I don't want to say once in a lifetime, hopefully it's not once in a lifetime, but like for a decade, organizers have been, you know, waiting for this moment to pass a really massive bill that addresses climate change. And um, the politics are lined up. We have the trifecta. We have Biden, who is at least, you know, appearing to be responsive to progressive climate demands. Um, and we won't have this chance forever. And so I'm very focused on, on getting it across the finish line in the most progressive, ambitious, equitable manner. Um, but I think, you know, there obviously will be work to be done. And, and like I said, the, the bill that passes with Manchin's vote, vote is not the bill that 
you know, gets people out in the streets necessarily or emotional or visionary, et cetera. And still it's worthwhile. Um, and still it's worthwhile. And I think it's hard to, um, maybe this is me getting older and more, like less idealist, but um, I think it's true. And, and I, I mean, my friends in the movement, I think share, share that understanding. Um, and yeah. I wish I, I had more challenge. And for all of us, it's the challenge of the time. So I think you answered that question really well, and I really appreciated it. So Marcella Mulholland, political director of Data for Progress, thanks for your years of great work in this area, and thanks for coming on the program. Thanks so much for having me. It's always a pleasure. Same here. And we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escow, and this is The Zero Hour.